welcome everybody. Uh, really look forward to sharing some of these highlights with you. Uh, you know, it was just just uh, just a month ago that we assembled in Miami for HCI's People Analytics and Workforce Planning Conference. Uh, the theme, as you see, is uh, you know creating positive business outcomes. And you know, as you as you think about today's changing environments and uh, you know affecting business outcomes through good talent management, human capital practices, you know, is a challenge. Um, but technology, and particularly uh, evolving analytics technology, really helps uh, the, the talent management practice, human capital, uh, HR practitioners, and particularly on the workforce planning side, uh, stay abreast of, of these issues. And, and, and that's what we're here today to share some of the highlights of, of the conference. Uh, Bill, as, a, as the MC for this year's event, um, uh, last month, would you share some of your key takeaways, you know, just at a high level, and then we'll we'll get into some of these some of the uh, the more specifics. Yeah, sure, Chris. Uh, well, first, I think it was a an excellent event overall. Uh, it was nice to be in Miami. So um, I live in Vermont, and uh, we've had quite cold weather for the last month. So it was fun memories to look back on a very nice conference. As I think about um, kind of the main themes, some of the things that emerged were. What I would think of as a bit of an evolution as we think about technology and analytics. Um, over the course of the last three or four years, there's been this move to do more analytics, to want more analytics. But I think the conversation at this year's conference really shifted to how advanced analytics can be used uh, and how they're going to not only be used today, but probably begin to emerge in different ways in the future. And so as I think about some of the presentations that we heard, that was certainly one key theme. Another was some very practical uses of analytics for topics that you might not expect. So uh, I recall um, the use of uh, looking at some workforce metrics in the way that Salesforce approached the topic of engagement, for instance. Uh, I think about um, a visualization workshop that I think we'll see a little bit of a highlight from later on today uh, that really looked at different ways to present data. And as I think about the experiences that people had on the ground, uh, it's a very long day, as you know, Chris, um, you know, listening to <laughs> keynote presentations from 830 in the morning until five o'clock in the evening or later can be pretty tiring. But uh, as I looked up often from my seat and looked out at the audience, uh, they were almost always um, full on attention, nobody checking their phones. And so I always think of that as kind of a, a good sign in terms of the content. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, the event in, in this webcast is, is perfect for, for those who need to learn techniques that can help, help you get started on your analytics journey. Um, we're actually going to learn a little bit about how to get, a, get ahead of artificial intelligence, some of the technology trends. As you noted, uh, we're going to learn some better communications and the story behind the data and, and how to even get beyond storytelling to, to really engage your stakeholders and drive decision making. So, you know, what I'd like to do is, is, is start with this, this concept of artificial intelligence. Um, Amber Mack, uh, one of our presenters, uh, presented a, this topic, demystifying AI, uh, and, and really took us through a day in the life in, in, in how our workplace is going to evolve. And um, I think the greatest point was she, you know, AI isn't all bad news, right? There's some good things that are, are going to come, come from it. So let's hear from Amber uh, and, and roll the video uh, as she begins to talk about how it might affect the workforce. So my job today with all of you is to demystify artificial intelligence and take you on a journey of what your life is going to look like over the next few years. But there's one question that I want to get out of the way because when I started speaking about artificial intelligence, every single time if we did a Q&A, this question came up. And the question is this. Will AI kill us all? <laughs> so let's get that one out of the way at the beginning of the presentation. You may think that the robots are coming for your jobs. We talk about the future of automation. I'm a lot more optimistic about the future and what's going to take place. When we talk about the robots taking over, I think about the smartphone that I carry in my pocket every single day that can't even last more than six or eight hours on a single charge. So I'm doubtful about the future of the robots. Nonetheless, we see headlines like this all over the news media, even headlines from tech leaders like Elon Musk 
saying that we'll be lucky if these robots enslave us as pets. So now I'm going to take you on a journey of a day in the life. Technologies that are leveraging artificial intelligence to help all of us through our days. And what I want to start with is starting in the morning of the near future, if this isn't already happening to some of you today, likely you will start using your voice to interact with technology. We're already seeing this with devices like Google Home and Amazon Alexa. If we know that we're experiencing something right now with smart speakers as just one example in terms of hyper adoption, you can imagine how a whole new generation of people coming into the workforce will want to have some way to use voice. At Arizona State University, what they have done is they've actually put Amazon Alexa on campus to make it really easy for students there to be able to access information like what time does the library close? What time is the cafeteria open? Because the expectation from the students is even after just a couple of years using this technology, they want voice on campus. We're also seeing this more and more in the workplace. About 29% of organizations have implemented some type of chatbot or voice assistant. I'm going to talk about chatbots in just a minute. And we're seeing this from a practical standpoint in terms of how it will help with productivity. Imagine walking into a meeting room and being able to use your voice to schedule a meeting versus pressing all those buttons on that spaceship looking phone that's in the middle of the desk. And you can imagine how time saving that could be in the future. So, you know, I, I, I was really intrigued by the part that she presented on, you know, the voice revolution, kind of the hyper adoption of, of, of voice enabled technologies, because I, I really do believe that uh, you're going to see this integrating into the workplace a lot more. Um, Bill, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, this one's uh, near and dear to my heart, Chris. Um, uh, we got two little kittens in the Crabe household last year, and... Um, my son, who's 11, decided that we should name them Alexa and Siri, which we did. And so <laughs> uh, we've got all kinds of crazy things that go on. But it's amazing uh, when you think about how much more you can do and how fast you can get answers to questions using this kind of technology. Um, and it seems uh, likely that the audience of five years from now is going to be so used to doing voice-type searches that will become less and less used to going into a search engine, for instance, and right. typing something in. It's really amazing. That, that, that's, a, that's a great tee up for our, our first poll question. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask the, the participants, you know, where do you see voice enabled assistance, you know, being used in your workplace? And you know, here's a couple options um, where, you know, you, you don't see any at all. You're, Maybe it's used to retrieve some, some information, maybe even from a workforce analytics uh, package or uh, being able to initiate ta tasks. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and run the poll. And uh, you, know, you can imagine you know, asking Alexa, you know, hey, email John in HR and ask if he's free to discuss my promotion. <laughs> you know, or Siri, please print the onboarding chapter of our HR manager's guide. Right. You know, Cortana, open a new Excel spreadsheet and forecast next year's headcount based on last year's workforce plan. Now, can you imagine doing that? <laughs> it seems well, far-fetched, but it's yeah. not, uh, perhaps not, not as far into the future as we think, is it, Chris? Yeah, well, look, the, a lot of people believe they can you know, retrieve information. A lot of people use you know, the voice assistance today. Now, of course, as a sponsor, we always like to align some of the things we do. So... Um, this next little case study, um, our, our next case study uh, features a, a young lady named Alexa. She's a voice assistant with a company called Amazon. And it's going to take us through a, a real quick case study called Voice Enabled Workforce Analytics. And, and this is actually a tool that Zeroed In has connected to its analytics platform. So let's give this a try. Alexa, introduce yourself. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions, play music, tell jokes, and more. To learn more, just ask, that, what can you do? Now, when we use um, the, the zeroed in skill for, for Alexa, you have to um, use what's called an invocation. So you have to actually ask Alexa to 
open the actual toolkit. So we do that by saying, you know, Alexa, open zeroed in. But then you're able to retrieve various facts and uh, reports and things that your analytics platform like zeroed in might be collecting and, and presenting. So let's, let's ask a quick question. So we might say, Alexa, open zeroed in. What can I tell you about your workforce? Retrieve average employee tenure. Average employee tenure for April 2019 is 8.40 years. Now, perhaps you want to go to a little more detail and you say, Alexa, open zeroed in. What can I tell you about your workforce? What is average employee tenure by region? Average employee tenure for April 2019 for South Metro Region is 9.37 years. For North Metro Region is 9.08 years. Stop. Now, perhaps you have some reports and you're in the boardroom with your HR execs and team and you want to say, Alexa, open zeroed in. What can I tell you about your workforce? List my flash briefings. The following flash briefings are currently available from zeroed in, compensation, recruiting, staffing. And of course, using Alexa and the skill, you can use synonyms. So finally, uh, to finish off, we might say, Alexa, open zeroed in. What can I tell you about your workforce? Get a report on compensation. Your compensation flash briefing for April 2019 is as follows. This briefing includes total compensation and average compensation for both clinical and non-clinical employees. For compensation, average employee oh, pay rate is Alexa. $37. An Thank you. Anytime. <laughs> All right. Now, unfortunately, I had a, a slide that was actually showing what was on the screen in, in our analytics platform, but it wasn't included in the deck. I'll, I'll add that as a follow-up. Um, but Bill, what'd you think about that? Well, I think it's amazing. I, um, the, <laughs> the concept is, is well, it's, it's very interesting that the, just the technology behind it, Chris, but I think the implications are what's really exciting there. When you think about HR becoming more strategic, part of that means separating yourself from the administrative work of doing what Alexa just did for you, you know, going in and figuring out where those things are and putting it into some kind of report that you can then share with somebody else. The work uh, of, of HR as it becomes more strategic is really on the uh, pursuit of insights and the context that goes along with these things. And so I think one of the exciting things about what Amber Mack was talking about and the connection to what you're getting at here is that while lots of jobs will probably be changed and many will be automated in some respect, uh, the jobs that remain will be much more high value and have the opportunity to do things using technology that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So uh, kudos, Chris. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> well, I, I, I felt doing a live demo like that is either going to be wildly successful or I was going to crash and burn miserably. <laughs> but uh, it seems... <laughs> She seems to be working fine today, not, not temperamental yeah. or anything. Um, no, that's well, great. <laughs> you know, this, this next presentation that we'd like to share, to share with you really gets to the, you know, to, to the heart of, of what people seek, and that's insights. Um, John Schwabish, um, as you see, is an economist and data visualization um, specialist. Um, John took us through this, this storyline, um, kind of... Uh, fashioned over the over a book you know if it's a, a children's book if you give a moose a muffin and, and you're going to hear how how he evolved that into um, a story about how to use the you know what visualizations to use to present the right information to your stakeholders um, th this was just one of of a number of conversations and, and presentations that took place at HCI this year there was also a a pre-conference workshop on Tuesday um, called Data Visualizations in a Pinch, Saving Time and Money Without Sacrificing the Story. And that, that was done uh, by a, a, a manager from Nestle, um, uh, Jade Peters-Votava, and it, I found that very interesting as well. 
but uh, John did a great job. He also held some workshops, one-on-one -on -one sessions where people could, you know, kind of bring their problems to him and he would help determine the right visualization. You know, he, he's got some resources um, that, that he's making available and, and we have a slide at the end that, that's gonna share those with you. So let's go ahead and, and roll the video on John Schwabish. So I spent a lot of time working with people, researchers, business folks, government analysts, data scientists, teaching them how to do a better job communicating their data, be it on slides, be it in reports, be it in blog posts, be it on websites. And when I start teaching them, I can always talk about best practices, why to avoid 3D, why to maybe not make a pie chart, why to maybe not make a dot plot, maybe not, not make this and that, we can all fight about that. But the one thing I always start with is trying to expand their graphic toolbox. Because everybody in this room knows how to read and probably even make a line chart, a bar chart, a pie chart. But there are lots of graphs out there and graph types out there that you can use. And some of these graphs can be inherently better at helping us visualize our data and communicating our content to our audience. And so a few years ago, I got together with a graphic designer friend of mine to create a library of graphic types. And so this is the first project that we created. It's a poster that has over 90 different graphs broken into six different categories, distribution, time, comparing categories, geospatial, part to whole, and relationship. And these linking lines and little text you can see strewn about demonstrate that some of these graphs don't fit into a particular specific category. Because this is the question I always get, which is, what is the right graph I'm supposed to use? And the issue is there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between graph type and data type. So that a column chart, for example, can be used to show changes over time, but it can also be used to compare categories. And so we created this poster to help people as a reference, as a resource, when they are starting to work with their data. Okay, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna make my one millionth pie chart, let me try to make something else. So I will start here. So if you give a nerd a number, he might want a table to go with it. And he could add more and more numbers, and he could take those, so we could focus just on that one number, and he could take that number, and he can plot it in an XY space. And he can add another number, and another number, and even more numbers. He could think about other graph types he could use to create a stacked area chart, or maybe a normalized area chart. He could think about other types of graphs, might create a paired column chart, or a stacked column chart. He could rotate that space 90 degrees to create a paired bar chart, or a stacked bar chart. And if you were to go back to those lines, he could add more and more and more data. And this might remind him that he could break these, this space up, this data up into different graphs, which might remind him to create spark lines or small multiples. And this might remind him that he could focus instead of on all of the data, just on the endpoints of the graph, which might lead him to think about a slope chart, which again, he could rotate 90 degrees to create a dot plot. And all this uncertainty about which graph we use for the data we have may lead him to think about uncertainty, which may lead him to think about a fan diagram, or a box and whisker plot, or a violin chart. And if you were to go back to that line chart and add a secondary y-axis, this may lead him to start thinking about correlations, which may lead him to think about a scatter plot. Or he could add another variable to create a bubble plot, or the unfortunate 3D bubble plot. Or he could combine the lines from earlier and the correlations to create a parallel coordinates plot. He could try other shapes to create a radial chart. Or he could combine the time with the correlations to create a connected scatter plot in which correlations are shown how they change over time. And this may lead him to think about connections, which may lead him to think about a network diagram, or a force directed layout, or a hive chart. And the curves in the hive chart may lead him to think about a chord diagram. And the arcs in the chord diagram may lead him to think about an arc chart. And he can combine the time from earlier with the arcs in the arc chart to create a sequential arc chart in which time is plotted from point A to point B, point B to point C, and point A to point C. And this very simply may lead him to think about time. This may lead him to think about a flow diagram, or a tree diagram, or very simply a timeline. And he could take that timeline and he could rotate it 90 degrees to create a Gantt chart. And he could take that Gantt chart and he can combine it with the form of the circles from the bubble chart. Or first he could create a, a, a calendar, also in time, and he can combine that with the circles to create a nightingale chart. And a nightingale is really just a circle that's been exploded out in all different directions. And so he could rein that back in and that may lead him to think about a pie chart. Or the truly unfortunate 3D pie chart. <laughs> 
or the truly, truly unfortunate 3D exploded pie chart. <laughs> or he could punch a hole in the middle of it, he could, he could blow that up, he could cut it in half, but all that's just a variation on a circle, and this may lead him to think about other shapes he could use, may lead him to think about a tree map, which he could also blow up to create a square cloud or stack them on top of each other to create a unit chart. And the squares in the unit chart may lead him to think about other shapes that he could use may lead him to think about an isotype chart in which we plot pictures of, of, of people or buildings or icons. And the people in the isotype chart may lead him to think about high frequency data, which may lead him to think about a heat map. And then he might start thinking about a contour map or the truly unfortunate 3D contour map. And this very simply may lead him to think about maps to which he could add circles or squares or lines, and the connections formed by the lines on the map may lead him to think about a specific point on that map where he's standing talking about the importance of data visualization and how our visual content is so important to under, for our audience to understand so that they can make discoveries, find insights, and improve the way they do their work. And he could take this point off that map and plot it in an XY space, and so if you were to give a nerd a graph, he might want a number to go with it. I, I love that presentation. It was um, it was it was right before lunch, and and it really created some great dialogues. And and if you, you know, I I kind of teed it up with being able to you know deliver insights and looking for the right way to visualize it. And of course, as you can tell, John is not a fan of of 3D visualizations um, by any stretch. And he, he kind of he spoke about that before the the, the part of the video clip that we watched. Um, but he did he mentioned some. To, to me, what we find some interesting um, visualizations um, when it gets to showing the relationships, right, between data points. You can easily yeah, see. I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, Chris, I think um, what, what, he obviously was a, a funny presenter. The audience laughed a bunch of times, but it's such an important point that he's making. There, there's more and more interest in being able to figure out compelling ways to get data across. And I think we've all realized that the standard pie chart and bar chart that most of us have grew up with and put into PowerPoints and Excel and, uh, and pivot tables oftentimes don't tell the story appropriately to be able to get somebody to say, okay, I get it, and I want to do something about this. And so I think John's yeah. poking fun at the, uh, at, the, at the topic at the same time that he's really making the point that it's more important than it's ever been. Yeah, you're right. The basic visualizations show you what's happening, right? They show you what effect is incurring or occurring. Something's rising, something's falling, something's steady. Um, but it's it's when you get into the the diagrams like Sankey diagrams, core diagrams, parallel coordinate maps, uh, these begin to actually show relationships and patterns uh, in the data. So uh, I encourage the the uh, the participants to, to seek those out, uh, particularly if you're, if you're looking to begin to show relationships. Yeah, somebody, so, I, I can't remember the, the name of this, but I'm sure if folks Google it, they'll find it. Somebody put together a periodic table of uh, visualization types, which uh, is an interesting reference point. So that's uh, really worth for, looking for. Yeah, and we at the end, there's a, there's a link to John's um, uh, diagram that he showed at the beginning as well. So what I wanted to just talk about next was they're just kind of what we call notable presentations. There's, there's no video um, attached to it per se um, on this one. Uh, but uh, this, this panel group uh, spoke about a, a new set of human capital reporting standards that, of course, it's titled are coming, but they're actually here. Um, there's a new ISO human capital reporting standard uh, 3414 that was recently released. Um, it's, it's, it's a little, um, it's, it's international centric. So it was actually evolved, I believe, out of the, out of the EU um, for the most part, but it is ISO uh, driven. So I wanted to uh, tee this up, um, this next poll question uh, with the participants. Are you ready for the new ISO human capital reporting standard? So let's go ahead and launch the poll and you know, here's, here's some of your options. Um, you know, uh, what standard, <laughs> right? Um, I've heard of it, haven't heard of it. Um, I'm, we're, 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 we're delivering on it. 
So I'd love to see how this evolves here with the audience. Uh, geez, I could be the only one that has purchased the ISO standard so far, huh? <laughs> They're not going to recoup their fees very well. Um, I guess not. Oh. Oh, there's somebody down there. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, there's a number of standards that you're going to see um, in addition to this ISO, which is you know, laying the foundation. Um, there's been a movement actually with the, this group of presenters who, who have been driving um, some standards with the Securities and Exchange Commission. They're trying to get human capital onto the balance sheet, right, On, uh, for companies in their publicly, um, you, you know, their, their public disclosures. Well, uh, it's so an interesting topic, Chris. I, I find this, you know, this has been the holy grail for quite a while now. Uh, so I think Jeff Higgins was the moderator of this panel from mm -hmm. the Capital Management Institute, which is different than HCI, so that it's a different organization. But the um, this idea of being able to really quantify in, in a meaningful way what kinds of investments and um, return on those investments are being made in the human capital space has – is a legitimate topic and a really interesting one. So uh, while I, I do, I'm not too surprised that a lot of the audience mm -hmm. here is saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. Uh, I also think this is, is a, perhaps a move afoot to understand what human capital investments look like a little bit yeah. better. Well, well, let's, let's, let's take a quick, a quick look at the, um, let's go back to the slides um, and, and take a quick look at the standard itself, really. Um, so the ISO 30, um, 3414 identifies a, a series of metrics, these specific categories, um, uh, it, it, and it really goes to a level of detail in, in, in not so much how these measures are, are, are quantified. You know, some of that's left up to each, each individual organization, uh, but it creates a standard for actually you know, presenting these in a way that that, that provide a baseline for what should be reported. So you can see through the categories, you know, compliance, workforce costs, diversities, uh, succession, and so on. And, uh, you know, this, I, I, I see this evolving uh, over time, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. There, there's another organization that, that has done some similar work around this. It's, uh, you may have heard of the Talent Development Reporting Principles, TDRP. Uh, they've been at it for a while. Uh, we aligned with them early on, and, and that allowed us to really then, you know, kind of knock, knock these ISO standards out of the park with, at zeroed in, in that we're able to develop, you know, a human capital investment statement that contains many, if not all of those facts that the ISO standard um, indicates should be reported. So the, the, the human capital investment statement, it's a report, but as you saw with Alexa, it can also become a flash briefing, you know, in, in whole or in part, so that you can obtain quick access to these facts, uh, point in time, year over year, changes, and so on. I just thought that was uh, interesting and, and, and worth sharing. Yeah, I thought it was a very – I mean, a panel discussion sometimes at conferences are tough, uh, but I found the uh, audience really was uh, well dialed in to the discussion that these folks were having. So I agree. I think it was a good yeah. good takeaway from the conference this year. Yeah, for sure. So the, the next um, presentation that, that we'd like to share with you from, from the conference that you know I, I felt was pretty compelling um, had to do with this 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 concept of persuasion and it was you know you, know, you have, have to remember these sessions are you know, these are you know 45 to 50 minute sessions and you know we're pulling little snippets that 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 highlight a you know a particular area um but one of one of the areas in randy's presentation about using persuasion and in, in the skills of persuasion to uh you know to carry your message to your stakeholders really had to do with metaphors and it's kind of, it was odd the way he positioned it, I think, is he said metaphors that would kill your message. Um, but then he, you know, then he led into what, you know, what metaphors wouldn't, you know, don't kill your message. What are the right ones? So uh, 
let's go ahead and roll the video and uh, hear from Randy about persuasion and metaphors. Data metaphors that kill your message. Data metaphors that kill your message. Believe it or not, there's an entire mapping of data metaphors, uh, ultimately. Uh, Aristotle said the greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor. The reason he said that is because metaphors work. Stories are really short metaphors. Metaphors are elongated stories. Metaphors, uh, sh stories really are just very, very sh uh, short stories are metaphors. That's how they work together. So the principles of storytelling work and are effective with metaphors as well. It works. The emotional appeal, again, is the fastest path to your brain, is an emotional appeal. Storytelling is the most effective way to make an emotional appeal, and metaphors are the shortest and fastest way to get to a story. So if you're not good at storytelling, you can at least be good at metaphors. And there's data out there to help you, uh, for sure. Metaphors ultimately really get people to see what you're saying. This is a mapped uh, list of metaphors, powerful metaphors. Uh, it's from Toward Data Science, about big data metaphors that we live by. I'm not going to break this down for you. I just want you to know that this exists out there. And you can benchmark the metaphors that you're already using and whether or not they're effective. Just understand that some work and some don't. The question really with regard to data and metaphors is how are you using them and are they working for you really? Because you think about it, how do you want your data? Do you want it raw? Do you want it medium rare? Do you want it well done? There's a lot of food analogies that come with that, but raw data is not necessarily useful, nor is raw food. It's not effective. You have to make it palatable. It's a storytelling, persuasion, metaphor building effort, and that's your job if you're going to be effective in communicating this. You've got to be able to break it down. People have to be able to relate to it. Also from the same article, they sum it up in this way. They said, when big data metaphors, <clears throat> when big data metaphors erase human sense making, people can't make sense of your metaphor. It doesn't resonate with them. All the ways in which you value uh, what you want them to accomplish, if you bake things in there that just don't really strike it for them, you've lost the plot. You've not found it. And storytelling is dependent upon plots to get people to go to new alternatives. So, yeah, I, I, really, I really love that theme because there's, there, there's a whole lot of metaphors, right, that you can pull into the, into the data, the data science, the workforce analytics world. Um, you know, he, he talked about the, you know, the food metaphors, but, you, you know, there's, and you saw in the chart, there's, you know, the, kind of the liquid type of metaphors. You know, you talk about data pipelines, right, which are workflows. Uh, moving data from you know your human capital system to your to your data lake right um, or your data pool and you got data marts and mini marts and you know there's different concepts about data exhaust right data trails or data crumbs and you've got clean dirt you got clean data you got dirty data you know which is whether it's relevant or you know maybe obsolete um, now you did say raw or cooked data I wonder if there's rotten data too <laughs> um, <laughs> there might be a lot Chris. Yeah. yeah, you have to ask yourself what you know. What shape is your data in, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I found we, this was. A, I, I I'm very impressed with Randy's stuff. This is the second time that we've had him at our conference, um, at, at a conference, and the last time was about storytelling uh, in a somewhat different way. But this idea of being able to tell stories is tremendously important. Uh, we, we live in a world in which we just have access to more data than the human brain really is, is designed to process. And so the question is, can we get context and meaning out of it? And storytelling uh, makes that happen. Um, there's a, a lot of scientific evidence that stories actually cause oxytocin synthesis. And oxytocin is, um, is a way for us to feel connected and hopeful about things. And so it's very powerful. Um, and I think Randy is exactly right. There's some, like, like the visualizations topic, there are really good visualizations, and then there are visualizations that are confusing. And the same is true for this concept of metaphors that he's talking about here. Yeah, I think the you know you, I think that one of the most the the, the 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 most famous data metaphor is garbage in, garbage out, right? So uh, that's a good one. Yeah. But to, yeah so, but you, you're right. Telling the story at at zeroed in, we we use a concept called data rooms, and and the data rooms help really describe and provide contextual description, whether it's 
analyst guidance, whether it's identifying how a particular, you know, formula is, you know, is calculated or a particular measure. Um, it, it really helps provide the context so that, you know, sometimes the data can't stand on its own, right? Agreed, 100%. Yeah. In fact, I, I would yeah. say that most of the time it can't stand on its own unless that context, the qualitative side, needs yeah. to come along with the quantitative side in order to be able to get ideas across. Yeah, I mean, these these data rooms interact with our visualization, so you you can literally you know take what what would be traditionally a dashboard and actually create an infographic from it by adding both data and text together you know, uh, to, to tell that story. So, cool. I'd share that. So, um, as you know, let's, let's carry that theme of storytelling, um, a little further. Um, Moshe, um, Marlies from, from Kaiser Permanente, uh, really took us beyond storytelling. And I, I think he did it in a, in a, in an interesting way and, in, in, in sort of a paradigm shift as, as, um, as the way I saw it. So let's hear from Moshe um, about how we can get beyond storytelling and, and really sustain stakeholder engagement. Next is planning the sequel. All right, so you've wowed them, you figured out what kind of analytic you're supposed to do. What do you need to do next? And it's really about changing your mindset. Number one, don't think of yourself as an analyst, think of yourself as a consultant. What is an analyst? An analyst presents the data. An analyst shows you, answers your question, and then moves on. What is a consultant? A consultant is worried about the whole story. A consultant wants to continue the conversation. Certainly, if you're an external consultant, there may be financial reasons why you'd want to continue that conversation. But even as an internal, you want to continue the conversation, take a holistic view, not just saying, here's the answer to your question, but why are you asking? Next. Instead of being reactive, be proactive. It doesn't just mean with your analytics and saying reactive is backwards looking and historical trending and versus predictive modeling. It means waiting for a project. Sitting there, well, my stakeholder hasn't reached out to me, so you know, I don't really have anything to do with them right now. No, be proactive, reach out to them. When I look at turnover data each month, the slides that I end up showing or the meeting that I end up having, having, having with them is nothing compared to the kinds of analysis that I did on my own. I want to create my own project. I want to be able to raise my hand and say, hey, you may not be aware, but I just looked at this location for this job family at this level. You have a problem. Let's engage in a conversation. Be proactive. Number three, don't present information, present insights. I once heard at a conference somebody say, interesting is the death of action. And I love that quote, because information is interesting. If I get an email back from somebody after presenting some information, and they say, interesting, Moshe, thanks, then I failed. Interesting, or information, is demographics. It's here's our representation by ethnicity. Information is turnover, 7.5%, not coordinated, not connected to anything. Insights make the connection. Insights tell us who, what, where, and when insights dig deep. Last, shared services to a business partner role. Shared services has been a hot topic inside HR. It's been a long time since or different pieces of organization have moved on to shared service. It started with payroll, then benefits, compensation. Even workforce planning and people analytics are moving towards a shared services type role. I'm not saying that shared service is bad, that's not, all, not true at all, but I'm saying your personal mindset. Don't think of yourself as I am this shared service robot and I need to get a request and it needs to look exactly like this and if it doesn't look like this, I'm not gonna lift a finger. You have your standard processes and if you don't follow those processes, I'm not gonna get back to you. No, think of yourself as a business partner. What does a business partner care about? Well, they're called a business partner because they're partnering with the business, with the operations. You care about what they care about. Anything and everything that they care about that they have to worry about in order to make sure our operations is going strong, that people are effective at their job, that's what I care about. I consistently put myself in their shoes to understand what do they need in order to get done. 
So you know, as you see that you know there, there's somewhat of a paradigm shift that that Moshe took us through, and and of course we've we've seen this in in uh, in HR right over the years, going from you know very transaction oriented to much more strategic, as we you know as uh, as we as we get into the you know the the, the planning and strategy and, and gaining a seat at the table. So you know what one of the, the takeaways for me in that piece was was where he said insights make the connection and and they dig deep and he said you know the who what where and when I I, I will say he left off the why. <laughs> um, and to get to the why, you know, that's where you need advanced analytics, right? You need root cause analysis. You need pattern analysis. You need cl classification algorithms that, uh, you know, through their technology can explain really why something uh, is happening. And then, of course, your visualizations do, you know, to, to present it and, and make sense of it. He also, I, I like the way, you, you know, he, he said, you know, kind of, Put yourself in their shoes to understand what they need to get their work done, and and, and a lot of people don't do that today. Bill, what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I that resonated with me also, Chris. I think that this idea of being an HR business partner, as he talked about, means really getting on the same side of the table and saying what is it that we're trying to collectively address here. Uh, I was uh, when he was talking about insights. I was brought back to one of our earliest conferences on this topic um, years ago. Now we had Brian Ong from Google talking about uh, Project Oxygen as, as a project that they had just recently completed. This is now I think six or seven years ago, and he talked about insights in his presentation and described insights as an aha moment, a place where you see a connection between two things that you didn't know existed before, and that connection offers the opportunity to do something differently than you're currently doing it. And uh, mm -hmm. that concept of being able to really work with the business on what needs to change using analytics, I found uh, very compelling. Great. Well, you dug deep to share that one with us. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes back a few years. I, think, yeah. Yeah. I, I know we've been, in, this is our sixth year at your event and it's, I think yeah. the 12th year you've been holding it. And uh, I remember meeting with some people and they asked, I asked, well, why, why are you, because they told us you, they were going to the HCI event. And I said, why, you know, why are you going to HCI specifically? Because there's so many, you know, people, workforce analytics events and so on. And they said they just have a track record. They've been doing this for so long. And it, it really goes to, to show, you know, the, uh, the investment you all have made. Yeah, so, well, it's been a good journey. Yeah. So final poll question. Um, I, I'd love to learn from the participants as we – you know, as we as we, we we move on, you know, what are you, what are you each focusing on as it relates to workforce analytics? Um, are you at the director level? You know, you just want to develop a, a strategy. Are you at the manager level? You know, you're you're wanting to use the data and insights to improve business, or are you want to roll up your sleeves and actually get dirty in the data and um, you know create uh, data sandcastles, right? <laughs> uh, all of the above, none of the above. Let's let's show the poll. And uh, see see what our groups are, what the participants want to do here, what their focus is. There's some inter interesting. It's, uh, none of the above. They must have uh, selected the wrong webinar. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I love to, I love to learn what. Maybe you can put in your put in the notes or, or in the in the comments. Um, you know what what it is you're, you are looking to do uh, with workforce analytics. Maybe they're, maybe they're providers. Um, so interesting. Okay, so some, a lot of analysts, uh, some managers. And great to see some diversity here. All right, let's, uh, I'm actually using this to kind of tee up the, the next uh, part of, part of the, the webinar. And it's, it's, a, it's a final notable presentation, as I like to call them. Um, again, there's 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 no video tied to it um, for for this this part, but uh, Jared Valdrone from GitHub and uh, GitHub's a technology company. Anybody who does any type of software development or Skunk Works type of work, uh, you know GitHub. It's it's a repository for storing your source code and providing you know collaborative development. But Jerry, Jared shared with us um, kind of how you roll up your sleeves and get dirty with the data. Um, he actually shared some techniques of, of going out and collecting public data sets. 
And a lot of people use public data sets for benchmarking. So there's, uh, for instance, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has some great public data sets. Uh, the, there's an organization called ONET, which provides some, some great data sets around uh, learning and talent. But Jared also showed some technology that allows you to go out and actually scrape data off of websites. So let's say you wanted to scrape um, data from uh, Glassdoor or from you know, a monster.com or indeed.com where you're looking to gather labor statistics. You know, what's the supply and demand in our particular region? Jared showed you know, some of the open source technologies available uh, to do that. So I found that pretty interesting. Uh, so yeah, what do you think? I, I, well, I did too. I, um, well, I, I found the part interesting where I understood what he was talking about. There was a good portion <laughs> where I was like, I, I'm not sure what I'm, that I'm keeping up with the times here. But his conversation around scraping, for instance, really engaged the audience in a way that it didn't expect. I don't know if you remember, Chris, but there were several people, I think, in the audience that asked questions during the Q&A uh, about um, kind of scraping. And I was surprised that there was that much interest in what I would have yeah. thought as a, you know, relatively esoteric topic. So uh, very interesting. And it, to me, it also spoke to, I think, another thing to understand about data, which is that um, while we already have at our disposal in the human capital space, thousands, perhaps millions of different types of data uh, we're going to be confronted with and have the opportunity to influence, be influenced by many types that are, are just beginning to emerge. You know, we may be able to look at, um, you know, that, I don't know if you recall from last year or the year before, uh, a company called Jawbone beginning to measure sure. uh, how, how many steps that their employees were taking. Um, the, the, we know more and more about human psychology and can quantify it in a variety of different ways. So we could begin to use data that we've never had access to before. And uh, Jared's uh, presentation, both from a high-level standpoint but also from a theoretical standpoint, um, spoke to me about what, what the opportunities are. Yeah, it sure did. Um, so th this this next slide just kind of highlights some of those resources that, that – what, um, the, on the bottom that Jared shared, but um, also a link to the ISO uh, 3414 uh, human, human capital reporting standards. So, so those of you who have attended that uh, would like to you know, download the presentation, access these links, um, Jared also shared a link to, that's available on Google, right, where you can search for public data sets. So it's toolbox.google.com slash data set search. Um, and it, you can put in really any keyword, and it's going to kind of zero you in uh, on 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 um, on the information you're looking for. We like to use that term a lot. So, with that, we're going to go to the question and answer phase as we as we we wrap up today's webinar. Uh, Holly, I will turn that turn this back to you for a moment. All right, Chris, thanks so much. So yeah, we do have a few questions that have come in and I think we'll have time to get to that. And Chris, I believe you've got one more piece of information that we are going to put up toward the end, if I'm correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. So perfect. yeah, let's get to that very first question. First question comes from Nelson. So how automated and accurate is today's analytics technology in creating real insights and those aha moments? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll tackle that one because uh, that's um, what we do. Um, essentially, it's zeroed in. You know, you, you look at, at the technology today and, you know, a lot of the technology is, is quantifying facts and it's identifying and looking at trends and patterns and, and providing visualizations through dashboards. But when you, when you really get to, you know, producing insights, um, there's, there's some work involved. Now, it can be automated because many of the tools provide um, what you might think of as alerts. So let's say, for instance, you want to monitor um, the diversity within your organization, right? So you're managing a diversity inclusion strategy 
and you want to monitor the diversity of your managers and non-managers across different segments, um, demographics of the organization. Uh, you can set thresholds with those alert type tools that can indicate um, you know, when, when some threshold is exceeded or met, um, and then those alerts that fire, because they're, they're being reviewed on a, on a recurring basis, can actually then provide an action. And of course, that action is, is entered in by the person who set the alert. Um, but at the end of the day, the, these insights that are developed, they need to be curated regardless of, of whether the technology is, you know, is finding them, um, they need to be validated. And if, if they're, you know, it's, again, it's kind of like the garbage in, garbage out um, metaphor that, you know, the, the insight needs to be curated for its relevance and for its actionability. And a, as a result, um, that's where you're really going to get your most value. So the tools can automate it, but there is a level of, of, um, of curation that, that needs to occur. All right. Great explanation. Thanks so much, Chris. Yeah. Bill, anything for you there? No, I don't think so. I think Chris, uh, Chris nailed it. So All right. Awesome. Let's take some other questions. Yeah, sure thing. Next question comes from Alex. So at what point in a company's maturity or at what level do you see them engaging with an analytics provider, perhaps like Zero Dead? Sure. Um, the, the companies that we work with, you know, are, you know, many of them are at varying levels of maturity, but most companies have gone out and attempted to do some type of data collection, data visualization, reporting on their own, you know, using tools like, you know, Excel, Click, uh, Tableau, uh, other capabilities. And where we, where we find that we can really help them is those organizations that are just kind of up to their neck in, in the data, right? They're, get back to the metaphors, right? Uh, the data, is a mess, data can be a messy business. And a lot of organizations spend so much time collecting from aggregate systems. You know, you may, <clears throat> excuse me, be on one, one core HR system in the cloud, but you might have a separate talent system, a separate applicant tracking system, another performance management system, something on premise, business data. So being able to bring that all together, that's where organizations like Zeroed In, other vendors in, in the work in, in this space can really help organizations when you know, they're, they're spending too much time collecting the data, not enough time using it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I'd just add on that one, Chris. I think that the that last piece that you added is really important, which is that uh, as you think about it, is your in, your organization going to be influenced by the data and allow allow itself to make better decisions based on it? And if the answer to that is yes, we want to make better decisions using data, then it absolutely makes sense to begin down this road with a variety of different kinds of technology platforms until you get to that place. You have to spend the time to really make mm -hmm. sure that the audience knows that there is data available about human capital that can help them make better business decisions. Yeah, great point. All right, thanks, guys. We have just yeah. a couple yeah. more minutes yeah. left. So, Chris, I believe that next bit of information will be yeah. Alexa and zeroed in examples. Oh, okay. You were able to bring that in or? Yep, we can put it up. Um, you won't be able to see it, but yeah, our audience yeah. certainly can. Yeah, bring it up real quick. If you, you know, <laughs> you know, if you if you stayed on the, you know, if if you're still on and you were you're hearing the Alexa demo that we did earlier, th this was the slide that was supposed to be up when, uh, you know, when we were doing the Alexa demo. So if I had said Alexa, open zeroed in. What can I tell you about your workforce? Retrieve employee tenure. Oh. Average employee tenure for April 2019 is 8.40 years. 
So thank you. <laughs> so again, it was, uh, you know, you could see that, you know, you have the tool collecting those, those, uh, those facts, those insights, but using Alexa as a, as a vehicle to um, obtain them and access them. Great. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, sure. And then if you want to tell us about this additional resource that we have from zero to hero. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is uh, this is a you know, sort of a, a, a short white paper and story that 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 we've we've published that really kind of takes the this transformational journey from you know an organization who wants to deliver insights and you know how they can go about doing it you know levering tech, le leveraging technology uh, to actually you know improve their position um, and and HR's position in the workforce so. It's on our website. Um, it's called Zero to Hero. Uh, it's at zeroedin.com. Uh, I welcome um, all of you. This is a direct link to that um, uh, to that to that white paper. But you can also um, obtain it by submitting the the download forms on our website as well. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to share the highlights from uh, this this year's conference. Yeah, it's been terrific. I, I appreciate it as well, Chris. And I will say, I, I have to say that I think it's very nice of you to thank Alexa at the end of your questioning of her. Um, <laughs> and I'm, but I'm wondering what happens if you don't. So you may want to be careful about that. You never know. <laughs> Great. All right. All right, well, guys, Holly, thanks again so much. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll just say thanks to Alexa, too. It kind of seems like the thing to do today. So thank you to everyone, human <laughs> or not, for being on this webcast today. <laughs> Folks, don't forget that today's webcast has been approved for HR, CI, and SHRM credit. Give us just about 24 hours and then head on over to your My HCI profile and visit your My Learning Journey to obtain those credit codes. So we hope everyone has a great day, and thanks for being with us.